Welcome everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to today's topic of getting more contrast out of life. My name is Katie Frederick and I am the digital content manager for the APH Connect Center Vision Aware site, which is um, focuses on the adults, professionals, and professionals who serve them. And today we are going to talk all about contrast. But before we get to that, I will pause the recording here and give everyone the um, opening ACV REP credit code. Good afternoon. For this afternoon's webinar, we are going to talk about getting more contrast out of life. And to do that, um, to help us do that is the presenter. Um, Kristen Shiflett is an occupational therapist with the um, Lions Vision and Research Rehabilitation Center at the Wilmer Eye Institute, which is at um, John Hopkins um, University. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Kristen, and welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. <clears throat> thank you, Katie, and welcome everyone. Good morning or afternoon, depending where you are. So like Katie said, my name is Kristen Shiflett. I'm an occupational therapist at the Wilmer Eye Institute. Just a little bit about myself. Um, so I've been an occupational therapist for about 16 years now. Um, I graduated with a master's from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, after um, St. Louis, I came to Baltimore. Um, I've been with Johns Hopkins, like I said, since 2006. Um, I first worked inpatient rehab. Um, so basically, if anyone recovered from a stroke, a hip replacement, I went to see and work with those people as they were recovering in the hospital. And um, as part of our professionalism, we take continuing education credits. And so one of them, I went to Mary Warren um, in North Carolina. She had a continuing education course about vision. And ever since then, literally, I've been hooked. Um, and so basically, um, I did the University of Alabama Birmingham two-year program uh, for the graduate certificate in low vision. Um, and then in 2013, um, the occupational therapist left here and then I, um, observed with her and then I kind of, we, uh, switched, I took her positions where she left. So I've been here with Hopkins at Wilmer since 2013 and I still do that peer and work at Bayview. So it's nice to kind of still work with those patients in that rehab setting as well. So here at the clinic, um, I work with an amazing team of people, um, and we, um, I do home visits sometimes, um, work site evaluations if needed. Obviously with Hopkins, we do a lot with research and then mentoring. Um, I actually have my first level two student here um, from Towson University and then mentor anyone else who's trying to get their uh, specialty certification and vision. And of course you have to have cute pictures of your family on your slides. Um, so my husband, uh, Steve, my daughter, Savannah, who's two and a half, and then, of course, the dog, who um, Harper, who is three. She's a golden doodle and very cute. So like I said, I work at Johns Hopkins with an amazing group of people. We are small but mighty. Um, we are not many. There's less than 10 of us, and I feel like we do a lot of good work. Um, so um, the, doc, the therapist also I work with is Jim Deramick, Heather O'Connors. Um, they have their certification in low vision. Um, and then our research staff, um, Kyoko leads us. And then we have great front off staff. I would not be able to do what I do without these people. So of course I have to include them in this presentation. The goal of the Lions Vision Research and Rehabilitation Center, again, we're a part of Wilmer Hop and with Hopkins, you know, where they're trying to every day trying to find cures for these diseases, but we need to function in the meantime as these cures are trying to be created. And so basically the purpose of our center is to maximize the patient's remaining vision and to enhance their function and independence. We want everyone to be safe, healthy, and happy. 
So basically we do not have any surgical and medical interventions during our clinic. Um, we do not fix people's visions. We work with what they have. So basically we look at different levels of system technology. Um, something as low tech as adding a rubber band to a bottle, which we'll go over later, um, to something high tech, you know, like using a talking device or a desktop CCTV. Um, so we have the whole spectrum of things. We're very goal oriented clinic. Um, so we want to know what the patient has difficulty with, what is important to them and how we can successfully make them um, do that activity. We also talk a lot about organizational strategies. As most of you probably know, organization is number one. It's the freest thing we can do for ourselves to make things better in our environment. And then also working with Hopkins, we have a lot of community resources in the area, state agencies that we collaborate with and try to make connections of those um, areas with our patients. So today we're going to again learn about contrast. So we're going to define what contrast is and how it impacts visual function. We're going to demonstrate how to measure contrast sensitivity, which we do in our low vision clinic. Um, we're going to provide contrast sensitivity solutions in the home for everyday activities. And then also talk about how contrast can be applied to technology like cell phones, computers, and e-readers. So basically when our patients come into the clinic, um, they're seeing the low vision optometrist first. Um, so these optometrists have specialized training in low vision. And so basically when we're doing that, we're looking at our, we're looking at mainly three big things. We're looking at visual acuity. So how big or small the letters need to be. And that could be for distance. So looking further away, like street signs, TV, um, and then visual acuity for looking at close, so reading, so near work. Um, and then also we do visual field confrontation. So looking at your side vision, if there's any impairment in that or your central vision. So typically with central scotomas, like from macular generation, glaucoma or diabetic retinopathy. The other thing we look at is contrast sensitivity, which again is the main purpose of this talk today. And we'll go over that some more in the next slide. But we are the only clinic that measures contrast sensitivity. There's not many professions that do this. And as far as the eyes are concerned, it's really the low vision optometrist that is measuring this. Now, again, I'm working with a lot of um, rehab therapists and occupational therapists. And again, I'm trying to get them to measure it too. But as an eye profession, we're the only ones that do that. I know it sounds shocking, but I just want, just want to reinforce that this is the only one that measures it. And then also what we do in the low get vision clinic, which we're, um, we spend a lot of time on is refraction. Everyone wants their eyes to be fixed with glasses, which unfortunately we know cannot always be the case, but we do want to spend time in doing that. So we use a trial frame and we really spend a lot of time trying to make sure our patients have the best vision possible with glasses. And then we focus on other adaptations to help them improve their function. So contrast sensitivity, the word you'll hear a lot today. So what is contrast sensitivity? It is the ability to distinguish an object from its background. We want to be able to detect ed edges and, and may accurately reflect the capacity to detect ground level hazards. So we look at contrast sensitivity in many different ways. We have the Pelly robson test sensitivity chart, which is to our to the left of the slide. If you look at this chart, it has very dark letters up top and it fades to below, to white. It um, is in sets of three letters. It starts again with those black bold letters and fades to white. The, um, the lowest level of contrast sensitivity is zero, and which is the black up top. And the highest is 1.92, which is the, the white below. Um, most patients, um, again, they would read this out to the um, to the doctor um, as they can see it. And then if they have trouble with letters, we do have other ways of her, um, measuring contrast. So um, to the right in the middle of the screen is um, the hiding Heidi. So she's a bright smiley face um, on the left and it fades as it goes off down to the right. Um, also because um, for portability, I do have occupational therapists in the hospital use, it's called the Leah numbers test again, bright black letters fades to white and it's a flipper chart. So it's something nice and portable they can take with us in the clinic. So typically um, if we're looking at contrast sensitivity, um, I've highlighted 
about the fifth line down, which is um, the technically the moderate contrast sensitivity level. And this is probably where most of our patients, I would say maybe the average is in our clinic. Um, but as you can see, there's more lines below, um, but this is probably where I would say the average of our patients are. So what does contrast sensitivity impact? Or who, I'm sorry, who does contrast sensitivity impact? Everyone. Um, as we age, contrast sensitivity does change. It does decrease naturally. But when you add any one of these eye conditions on top of it, like macular generation, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, optic neuropathies, even cataracts, that makes the, that can impact the contrast sensitivity more. And so it can be even more reduced than it would be with average aging. So how does it impact function? So typically in the clinic, the first thing that people note when they have some difficulty with contrast sensitivity, it actually is reading. Um, they're telling me that the quality of the print that they see is less, it's kind of faded gray. Um, and so it's hard for them to read their newspaper um, or the magazine or the book. And then next thing they typically talk about uh, mobility. Um, if you can see the picture on the right-hand side here, um, there's a picture of the stairs. And on the left side, of, there's two pictures of the same thing. On the left side, um, it is quote unquote normal vision. So it looks pretty clean. It has, you can see each individual step. Um, and so it's a little easier obviously to walk down the steps. But then if you have reduced contrast sensitivity, um, everything looks like a sheet of just a big sheet. You can't see those individual edges and you would be harder to go down the stairs. So with mobility, again, with low contrast, it has ability to detect those hazards, even in your own home, trying to see like the shoes that people leave on the floor or um, and any object that is dropped on the floor, a pill, a pill that um, people drop sometimes when they're taking their medications in the morning. Um, outside, again, the curbs, the steps, pavement cracks, all are very hard to see. Another thing is facial recognition, um, trying to see someone's face. I, you know, you might be able to make things a little bit sharper or larger with magnifiers, telescopes, but then even within that, trying to look at more detail, it's hard to see without, um, when you have low contrast. Seeing food on your plate is another common um, problem that patients tell me about. Um, so on the plate here um, on the bottom right, there's two images. Um, one has a white plate that has mashed potatoes, chicken, and corn, and the other plate has um, dark meat on a dark plate. So again, those very similar backgrounds make it hard to discern what is on the plate. And then the other key thing that people have difficulty with is driving, um, nighttime driving, especially with trying to manage the glare from the lights, um, but difficulty seeing road signs, street signs, um, stoplights, um, especially in low lighting, rain, or fog. So when we look at the research, we're trying to find um, research to support what our patients are telling us. So um, when for research, the test of contrast sensitivity, um, we need to test the evidence of contrast sensitivity rather than visual acuity to be more that are strongly correlated with falls. Someone with poor contrast sensitivity has the independent, excuse me, has been independently associated with slower gait, slower stride length, wider step length, so they have more base of support, feet further apart, um, increased double support time, and then a failure on walking tests because they take so long to walk. And then also impaired visual acuity and contrast sensitivity has significant consequences as it can impact um, cognitive function, social engagement, physical independence, and overall quality of life. So if you think about you're not doing these activities as well as you used to, of course, it's gonna impact the information you're trying to gain in by reading, which again, impacts the con with impacts your um, cognition. But then also, if you're not excited about doing things anymore than your overall quality of life. There was a very interesting research study that I found um, that was talking about gait, um, how we walk and visual function. So this article here discussed, um, they had about 4,000 patients and this was done in Ireland. Um, they had 
um, the people complete a social interview in their own home. So someone came out to their home, they assisted them with a computer personalized interview that talked about their social status, their cognition, um, their mental health and their physical abilities. So they completed that at home. And then they did went into the clinic and did a visual assessment. So they looked, did the um, early treatment of diabetic retinopathy studies. So the ETDRS, that is a, a standardized measure that we use here in the clinic to address visual acuity. And then also um, they did the functional acuity contrast test to look at the contrast sensitivity. They also had the patients um, do a gait assessment. So how they walked. And so basically they used, it's called a gate right electronic walkway system. And they were looking at their gate speed, which is the average um, or how, how fast people are walking, their cadence, which is the number of foot per minute, and their stride length, which is the distance between um, the two the distance between their feet as they are walking. So here is this gait stride system. So on the right here, there's a gentleman walking with a, um, a single point cane and um, he is on a mat that has, a, um, it's a, a long pathway mat that has the ability to record again, his gait speed, cadence and foot and uh, stride length. So basically the patients were instructed to walk this path two times but they were starting about 2.5 meters before this walking path. And they extended their gait about two meters after the walking path. And they did this two times because they wanted to make sure that they were getting a true, um, like their true walking pattern and didn't want it to be like, because of it's a test. So when they looked at these results, they were saying the patients that had better visual acuity, obviously they had better gait performance. However, the patients that had poor contrast sensitivity had a shorter stride length. So the, again, the distance with their walking and overall gait performance. People that had decreased visual, I mean, their decreased, I'm sorry, their visual acuity and contrast separately were not correlated with cadence. So again, how many feet they put per minute. So that didn't matter. But what did matter was people that had impaired contrast sensitivity and their overall stride length, it was um, decreased. And so basically they were possibly linking this to again, increased falls. So if you're not certain where you're walking and you have that gray area, of course, you know, it kind of makes sense. Of course, you're gonna walk slower. You're gonna be more cautious. And so this is actually measuring that, what we think as clinicians and what patients experience. So they do have that recorded. So when we, you know, take that research in consideration and what our patients are saying, again, mobility is a big deal. We don't want to fall. Um, we want our patients to age in place and age in their home because they know that environment forwards and backwards, right? We majority of people have lived in their homes for many years and we want them to maintain that. So the first thing we want to do to try to increase contrast and to make things a little bit easier for patients is lighting. So lighting also for someone with a vision impairment can be their nemesis at the same time. Um, you know, we don't want things to be too bright. We don't want them to be too, too dim. So we kind of have to have this, as I call it, this flexibility of light. So when we're in someone's home, when I do home visits, I want to make sure that they have even light throughout the home. I don't want pockets of light. So if you're going into the living room and then you go to the kitchen, that hallway, I don't want it to be really bright in the living room, really dark in the hallway, and then really bright in the kitchen. We really want it even as much as possible. So typically I would tell patients to use dimmers um, if they can throughout the environment. Um, in this top picture on the right, um, there's a, picture, a home that has some can lights, um, recess lighting in the top of the um, ceiling. So those can be on a dimmer, which can be helpful. Um, also sometimes you can use motion lights too, to help you get from one room to the other, but ideally, you know, keeping on the lights would be easier. Or if there's a smaller, um, time to light, you can put a light on a timer as well. The other thing in the kitchen is probably another big area that needs a lot of light. So undermount lighting, if possible, would be great to have. Um, and those actually can change levels to intensities, um, which is kind of, um, which is new in some of the um, newer models. So besides the placement of light, again, the flexibility of light, 
well, there's different colors of light. So you know, typically, you know, the daylight spectrum bulb um, is what typically we would recommend just because it's the brightest amount of light. But some people don't like that blue haze that happens. So we kind of look at different lights. So they could have a um, cooler, the cool tone like the daylight, or you can go to the warm tone um, like this soft white here, or the bright white is kind of like in the middle. So definitely I let each patient kind of decide what light feels comfortable to them. Um, and then we try to, again, place that throughout the home. Besides having overall light, we want to have task lighting. So a lot of my patients, I go into their home, like, see, I have good light. It's pretty good over here. But when they go to their favorite chair to read the paper or read a book um, or the favorite side of the couch, they need even more light on top of that. So we call that task lighting. So in the picture here, we have various types of lights that can be desk lights um, or floor lamps. But each of these, I wanna be able to have a gooseneck and that gooseneck is flexible. So we wanna be able to position it low. Um, so you wanna make sure it's low because you wanna get the maximum amount of light and you want a bit, bit, bit position between you and what you're reading. So the gentleman here on the left, he is working at a table. He's reviewing a document and he has that gooseneck pretty low. And then he has the light on and it's between him and the reading material. So it's not over your shoulder, over your shoulder, just it makes um, more shadows and it doesn't give you that maximum benefit of light that you're looking for. And then a lot of these models lately, um, both the Stella light, this is the Stella Go in the middle, but then also on the top right is the Ott light. Um, they do have, um, you can change the level of light. Um, so you can make it brighter or dimmer as well as changing the tone that we talked about earlier. Um, so definitely let you guys know those are available. And a lot of them now they're getting pretty sleek in regards to being wireless. Um, so just another nice thing. You don't have to worry about cords, something you're going to fall over. Um, you can take it with you as you go. So I bought patients, actually I bought one for my mom. She likes to sew and then she sometimes takes it into the um, computer room because she does a lot of computer work um, to read some of her documents for research that she does. So she kind of takes it with her throughout the home, which is nice. And then if beyond that, again, lighting is still important, even when we walk outside or when we're trying to go in the basement and find something, your closet to pick out clothes. So there's a lot of portable lights out that uh, more than usual. So, um, you know, there we have um, flashlights on our cell phones. They may not be the brightest, but it's something. Um, there are also um, this brand that we have here in the clinic that we use is called an Easy Red. So they have a portable pen but they also have a neck light. So something that you would wear around your neck and you can angle the lights depending on what you're doing. Um, but this has been helpful for reading in that easy chair um, for walking outside. I actually use the easy ride myself when I walk the dog at night. Um, and then also you could have a headlamp. Some people that is actually easier for them. And also depending on what their jobs are. I mean, not just people that work um, in a garage or mechanic and things like that, electricians, but some people would prefer to be hands-free. And so the head mount is easier for them to use. The other thing that besides lighting um, are filters. Um, there, so filters um, allow a certain amount of light to come in. Um, they come in many, many different colors. Um, this is definitely patient specific. Um, but a lot of the, um, but the very common brand or color is yellow. So this yellow, um, people can wear them for night driving to help with the glare from the, um, the bright lights, but then also you can use it inside, um, to help with the glare. So a lot of my patients, um, or they, to enhance the contrast, I'm sorry. So if they come in my bright clinic room and they're like, it's so dark in here. And I put these filters on them and it, they're like, wow, I can see your eyes which before they could not because it, there wasn't enough contrast for them to have. So the yellow is helpful. Um, and also you can wear them outside on overcast days here in Baltimore today. It is very overcast and rainy. Um, so this would be great for our patients to you to give them more contrast as they're walking outside. Um, the orange I did put up here um, because some with some of the brands, um, they recommend the orange is helpful for computer um, to give you a little more contrast. 
Um, but I've also had other colors like plum, a topaz um, help with that as well. So it gets in very patient specific and something that should be addressed in the clinic. Um, but uh, so there's just some options as well besides lighting. So we think about it. Contrast that so we've just talked briefly, you know, about the home a little bit, but think about what you do every day. So when you get up in the morning, we got to read an alarm clock. We have to walk to and from the bathroom. We get on the toilet. We take a shower. We brush our teeth. We pick out our clothes. We walk downstairs. We turn on a TV. You know, we're making coffee, eating breakfast. We're reading the newspaper or a book, you know, and then maybe looking at your phone or making a phone call. All of these things and many more, but this is just like within maybe the first 45 minutes of my life. Um, but all of those things can impact if you have impaired contrast sensitivity, all of these things can be impacted. So we're going to talk about some of these solutions and these are some everyday solutions that we can do. And then uh, again, a lot of these principles can be carried over to other things as well. So the good old shower. So the shower, um, in most places are white. Um, um, and so basically you're an all white bathroom. Um, you know, in the bathroom, there's a shower, there's a tub, maybe there's a toilet, there's a sink, but if you have low contrast, you don't know where things start and where things end. You're mainly looking at your memory, especially if it's your own home, you're using your memory to figure it because you know where things are. But if you go to a new hotel or if you go to someone else's home, you're not going to know where these things are. So it's to be more difficult. So how can we make this a little bit better? So basically we can add, um, we can add some high contrast items throughout the, throughout the bathroom. So having a nod skid dark bath mat in the tub would be helpful. Again, when you're trying to lift your leg over the tub side or even walk into the shower, you can now know where to put your foot because you can know, oh, that's the bottom of the shower. And then even beyond that, trying to know where the sink is, where the toilet, uh, where the toilet is, you can use these dark mats. It doesn't have to be necessarily black. Black gives you the highest level of contrast. But if your personality loves purple, you know, because you're a Raven fan, um, you can have a dark, a dark purple bath mat that will at least give you some um, contrast compared to the white floor. So um, also in the shower, you can have your shower chair. Um, for safety as always. And then a handheld shower and grab bars are also recommended just to be safe. And then even the storage of your, um, your um, shampoo, your soap, having that in a concentrated area versus um, the ledge on the side, which blends in um, and it's hard to see where to store those items. The good old shampoo versus conditioner. Um, this is always the complaint a lot with a lot of my patients. They're like, I can't even figure this out. Um, but in everyone's, de in their defense, it's difficult because they all look very similar. Um, you know, like, um, I have many examples on the screen here and the dove, the dove shampoo and conditioner are very similar. The only difference is, is how to open them. One opens from the top, one opens from the bottom. Um, and very similar logos. So of course it would be very difficult to see that. So one thing that people do, and again, this is probably one of my favorite low tech um, solutions is putting a rubber band around it, put a rubber band around it to make it a little bit easier. Um, so, you know, okay, I'm gonna put the rubber band around the shampoo. That's the shampoo. And then the one next to it is the conditioner. So that's just a nice, simple solution to help with a very common problem. The other problem that people have um, is putting the toothpaste on the toothbrush. You have a white bristled brush, white toothpaste and a white sink. That's a lot of white in one little area, very similar colors, hard to see. So um, even if someone had a dark sink and then they had dark bristles and dark toothpaste, all very similar, very hard to see. So doing the, the opposite. So having a white bristled toothbrush and then having colored toothpaste would be one way. Um, if you had a dark bristled toothbrush, having white toothpaste would be helpful. Um, I will say if that is difficult, um, I know one of my patients, um, she was dressed in pearls and dressed very eloquently for her appointment. I told her, I said, ma'am, if that doesn't work, you can literally squirt some toothpaste in your mouth and then brush your teeth. 
And she saw me two weeks later and said, that was the best thing I ever told her. <laughs> She's not making a mess in her toothpaste and her sink anymore. And it was the best. She said, this is great. Um, so these are some just, again, different options for the everyday common problem. And then the other problem people have, and I have this problem sometimes too, between blue and black. So I have two socks on here, um, one blue and one is black. So I'd be curious if people can tell the difference because it is tricky. Um, so color identification can be troubling. Again, lighting is probably the first thing people do. Um, they would grab the flashlight, they would increase the lighting in the room or take their clothes to the window and say, try to see if they can tell the difference. The other option is to use something called a colorino. So it is a device, a talking device, and it senses you put the, the object, the colorino up to the clothing object, push a button, and it will tell you if it's black, if it's red. Uh, purple. And then the other thing people can do, again, is my favorite organization, um, you know, separate those colors, you know, put them, put the blue on one side of the closet, black on the opposite. Um, you could have labeled bins um, for um, especially men that have those, those sock drawer. Um, you can put a labeled bin and put the blue socks on in one bin and then the black socks in another bin. And and then some of my patients, honestly, with all the difficulty with colors, um, they really start creating little outfits. So they have a hanger and they put their, they put an outfit together and just have it up on the hanger. So they'll have them out for the week. They can pick up a hanger and get dressed and have, and know everything matches. The other thing you do is, is definitely label items. And this could be throughout any part of the house, um, especially things that are hard to discern what it is. So you can have these labels um, on the top right. I have, this is actually my pantry. Um, I have labeled containers for the salt and the, and the powdered sugar and the sugar itself. Um, so I have a black label and then I use um, a white paint pen to write on them to see. You also can buy um, some, you know, I don't know if you guys like watching the home edit, the organization shows and things like that. Um, they do have um, lines of labels and stickers that are ready to, that you can, that are already done for you. Um, I have reached out to them to try to see if they can make them not as cursive, have like plain writing um, or print. So it'll be easier to read, um, but you could have those that have the white background with black letters. Um, the other thing is even just using a good old Sharpie. So on um, the bottom left here, I have a um, gallon of milk and it's hard to see that expiration date. There's not enough contrast and it's poorly print quality. So I took a Sharpie and I rewrote the date on the milk carton. So that is another way to help with expiration dates, especially like yogurt and milk. Those are really hard to see sometimes. Um, so that is another way. Um, the other thing you can do for labeling is using a talking wand. Um, so the talking wand or a pen, a pen friend. So in the middle picture here, I do have the talking wand. Um, it has, it's basically um, a talking labeling wand that you can program yourself. So it has little stickers that are sensors that you can put on the object itself. Um, and then you can program them with your voice and you can tell what they are. So that, and then basically once that sticker is on that um, object, you can use the wand and you can take it to different items to label things. So one of my patients was a jazz singer. Um, and so she loves music. And so she used the talking wand to help her label her CDs. Um, so that's one way that you can use this labeling system. So the other kind of thing, common thing we talk about again is food, um, whether it's beverage prep, um, just eating in general. Um, so basically if you're pouring a cup of coffee, um, you want to have the inside of that mug be white. The outside could be any other color. Uh, because again, if you're pouring the dark coffee into a white mug, that will be helpful. Um, so I know a lot of people are using cure eggs lately that can do it for you. But still, if you're still like the um, coffee pot and pouring it, um, that would be definitely something that could help having the inside of the mug being white. Um, there also is that tot liquid indicator, um, which is on the bottom um, right uh, left here. And so basically it has sensors. You add it to the side of the cup. The sensors, when it touches the water, makes the beeping noise to let you know it doesn't overflow. Um, so that is something that a lot of my patients um, prefer. 
And then also just eating in general. So if we, again, um, on the side here on the right, I have a black plate with the egg on it, the white egg. So again, that gives it that nice contrast. So you know where the food is on your plate. Same thing on the bottom right, there's a white plate with um, steak. So that dark meat, and even has some tomatoes on there. So those would stand out more. So I tell someone, if you have um, chicken, mashed potatoes and green beans, um, you can have the chicken and the mashed potatoes on a black plate and then have the green beans in a white bowl. So again, it allows them that independence to be able to see a little bit better what's on their plate. If they need more lighting, I do tell them to use task lighting. So any of those portable lightings, um, those lights that we talked about earlier, they can bring that to the table um, and even had someone um, in their home have an electrician add more lighting to their kitchen. And she actually put a can light right above her um, place where she sat at the dinner table. And so they, she was able to get more light coming in that way as well. So cooking tasks, again, you guys are probably seeing a theme here. Um, we are talking about, you know, the opposite color. So we're talking about cutting food. So on the top right, I have a white cutting board that has a piece of, again, I have fake food in the clinic. Sorry guys. Um, that's why it looks a little kiddish here. Um, so we have the cucumber and then on the right, we have like the onion. So again, it's harder to see that onion on that white cutting board compared to the cucumber. So if we were gonna do, if we were gonna cut to, um, the food, we would have a black and white cutting board. So it's the same cutting board glued together, one side's black, one side's white. So depending on, again, the color of the food that you're using, you pick the um, correct side of the cutting board. With the um, oven on the top left here, um, you know, the oven controls are all very similar, especially if you have dark appliances versus light appliances. Um, we want to, again, make it easier for people to see. So having the, um, you can use bump dots, um, which are on the bottom left here, they're tactile raised markings. You can add to that to make it a little bit easier. And so um, you can put the bump dot on the bake, or you can use puffy paint, which is that raised glue or 3D paint. Um, you can use that as well and put on appliances to help figure out which buttons are what. I do not recommend putting this on all of the buttons. Just want to pick a couple um, options so you don't so you can actually figure out which one is which. And then also we have like measuring cups and measuring teaspoons. They are black. So when you're getting the white um, flour or powdered sugar, you're able to see where things level off a little bit more. So again, back going to a little bit with mobility in the overall home. Believe it or not, I've been on home visits that houses look like this. There's a lot of white. White, everyone thinks looks clean, um, which it does, but for someone with a vision impairment, it's very hard for them to see where that couch is compared to the wall. Um, and then also I have been in someone's house, her actually, her name was, is Ruby and Ruby loved red and she had red curtains. She had a red um, couch. She had a red, <laughs> red carpet. Everything was red. Um, and so it was very hard for her to see in her home environment. So basically what we want to want to think about is again, contrast and so making the opposite color. So this is our, on the um, picture here on the left, we have our clinic. I have a light gray wall in my clinic room, um, but I painted the, or had them paint the border of each doorway, a different color um, compared to the um, wall color. So basically we have a Navy blue. So again, it's giving that contrast so people can figure out where to leave um, when they leave the clinic or enter because it is on the other side as well. And then also, again, talking about the couches and things like that. So if you have the white couch, the white wall, if we place it with a black couch, or if you wanted to do a dark, a little slightly different color um, wall color, that would be great to so give that more contrast. Even let's say you guys, there are people are very attached to their um, furniture and their colors of walls, you could put a blanket, you can put a, a different color blanket on the couch because that will stand out and know where that couch is or decorate it with a bright colored pillow, pillow that they can see as well. Um, another thing of then some of the basic things are light switches and outlets. Um, I went to a, my patient's home 
Um, she unfortunately had a fire in her home and um, a lot of her home was destroyed. And so when they built it again, everything was white. Everything was white. Um, and so I went to her home and she was like, Kristen, I can't, um, I can't find all the light switches. It takes me such a long time. She had like a little gas fireplace and she was like, I'm feeling this wall and I can't find that switch. So when I was with her, I, um, was able to try to show her, like, if we switched all your plates, would this help? And she's like, oh my gosh, I can see that's where that light switch is. So that, so we had the local Lions Club um, help out and they were able to um, switch out all her light switches for her, which was amazing. Cause she's like, now I know where I'm going. I'm not, you know, reaching too far out of her base of support to reach and grab um, that light switch. So now she knows exactly where she is in the area of space. So you can have the black, the black face plate and then have the light switch, or you can switch it the other way, have the switch be dark and then the plate be light. And same thing for the plug, same thing too. I mean, trying to find the plug sometimes can be tricky. Um, so having that extra contrast can be helpful. The good old finding items in the home. That's probably another very common problem. And a lot of it um, besides organization um, can be the contrast. And so basically a lot of the common things people tell me they can't find or the TV remote because um, it's a dark remote and a dark couch usually um, or their cell phone, their glasses, their keys, all those things. So basically um, the picture on the left has the table, has a, a glass tabletop, it's dark. And then I have my dark remote on top of that. So one way to make, if I'm just passing by or if I'm you know, trying to come in and the lights are a little bit dimmer and I'm trying to sit in on the couch, you know, I can't find that remote, but if I put a piece of paper there for this demonstration, I put a piece of paper there, but I would tell someone to use like a basket, a brightly colored basket, um, something that everyone say, okay, this is a rule of thumb. When everyone leaves this room, this remote goes in that bin. And I tell people to have that out throughout each important room of the house. So thinking of the kitchen, your bedroom, especially, um, most, if, most of you men are like my father, when he um, is retiring for the night, he takes everything out of his, you know, his pant pocket. So the wallet comes out, the keys come out, he puts his glasses down, the cell phone. So, you know, he has like a little bin on the top dresser and he puts everything in there. So it's easier to establish that routine, but then, and because if you can't find something, I'd rather you look and look for a basket and say, well, it's not in this place it's not in this basket or look in another basket versus the whole square footage of your home, right? Because when we are trying to find things that make us very stressed and we can decrease that stress by trying to have it a little bit more organized and a more contrast to see. So another big, like we talked about with the, um, the research earlier, stairs are a big deal. So we don't want, we don't want people to fall. And when you have low contrast, it's very hard to see some steps. Um, so in this image here, there's um, dark steps with dark carpet. Um, they do have lighting, lighter um, wall color, which is helpful as so you can see that handrail a little bit easier. Um, but to change things, we would want to um, make it a little bit easier for people to go up and down the steps. And people typically miss the bottom step. I've had a few people say they trip up, but mainly it's the last two steps that are difficult. So basically what we wanna do, obviously add handrails for safety. We wanna look at the quality of the steps. Does anything need to be repaired? Uh, is this a carpet? If it's not pushed in anymore and it's coming up, then we need to get that looked at for safety. But add lighting. And in Baltimore, we have a lot of old homes and these homes can't have a lot of electricity added to them. So basically I would use motion lights um, on the bottom middle picture here that um, we add motion lights to the steps. Um, you know, the 3M tape is amazing these days. Um, it's battery operated, so you can put those up. You can add duct tape or, or they also have this um, uh, nod skid tape here, which is yellow and black, kind of looks like the caution tape, but you can put that on the top two and the bottom two of the steps to help make that easier to identify. You wanna know where things start and end. And so that's what this tape can help with. Another thing kind of going beyond the um, steps, again, we're gonna talk about is medication. 
Medication is very, obviously very important for us to take when we need to take it. The first thing I would tell people is talk to your pharmacy, try to see what accommodations they have for people with vision impairment. Um, typically they can do large print labels. Um, if they can't do large print labels, um, people sometimes um, put um, uh, puffy paint on the top of the cap of the bottle that they're working with, um, or they can put a, um, a bold big B for something uh, for their medication or A for aspirin. They can write that letter on the medication label to make it a little bit easier for them to see, to discern what is what. Um, but if they have, if you guys have trouble beyond that, um, you know, we, there is a place, uh, a company called Script Talk. Um, so Script Talk can create a, has a programmable sticker that will go underneath the medication. And what that meant medi- is programmed by the pharmacist themselves. And then on the top right here, um, it shows the demonstration unit where you put the medication label on top and then it scans it and it read it back to you. And now, believe it or not, there's an app for that. So now they have an app that's available on Android and iPhone. It's called Script Talk. So basically, you would line that same um, code up to the back of your phone and uh, to the camera, I'm sorry, and it would scan it and read it back to you and tell you what it is. If your pharmacy does not have these accommodations, um, I know there was a big push, I want to say like five or six years ago. So CVS and Walgreens were doing it pretty regularly. I know CVS does it a little bit more than Walgreens, um, but always advocate and ask. Um, the more you ask, the better. Um, and Script Talk is a wonderful program. Um, you can call them and say, hey, can we figure out how to get this at my local air, my local shop? Um, some of these lovely mom and pop shops I've heard from um, patients are like, yeah, my pharmacist is wonderful. They'll mark the top of all my labels for me. Um, there's also like pill pockets where they put all your morning medications in a little pocket. That's really helpful too. Um, but if you need more help and feel like your pharmacy is not helping you, um, there is a, an agency called Accessible Pharmacy. Um, it's a home delivery service. They have all accessible um, products for the um, prescriptions. And actually it was... Um, it was started by someone that does have a vision impairment. Um, he and his um, softball buddy created the company together and they're very n- wonderful people. They have a lot of good educational resources as well. Um, so just letting you know, that's another um, option for you as well for your medications. Telephones, we always wanna make sure that people can call for help if they need it. Um, it's a, that is a big safety, to, uh, big safety um, thing for me, because I want to make sure that someone can call for help. And it's not only for the patient, but also think about for the family member. So if a person with a vision impairment is home with their, their spouse and something happens to their spouse, that patient needs to be able to call 911. So we need to make sure that everyone has an accessible phone they can use, whether it's a home phone or a cell phone. So these are two examples of, of large button phones. Um, and even these can be programmed to, if you push the one, it will say one. So there's more modifications that can be done with this. Um, there in Maryland, we have a state agency with the Maryland relay system that will help um, our patients pick out a phone and they work with people with hearing impairment, vision impairment, and cognitive impairment. So all, everyone can be able to use a phone. So I encourage you, if you don't live in Maryland and you live um, in other states, to encourage to reach out to the agency to see if someone can help you. And then also with our lovely cell phones, um, the technology, uh, you do have the availability to um, get more contrast on the cell phone. Um, so we, these, these instructions are for the iPhone. Um, it, you do have go to settings, accessibility. And when you open that, um, you have display and text size. You can make it the font bolder, larger, and overall increase the contrast on your phone. And if you wanted to change it where you had the black background and white letters, you can do the accessibility shortcut to, it's called smart invert. So it will flip back and forth as needed, or you, you can um, put it in dark mode. Um, which makes everything dark, but doesn't work all the time, depending on how you're using your phone. Um, Apple's getting a little bit better with that. For you Android users, um, it is also basically the same thing, but Androids, I feel that every, you go to settings, you go to accessibility, it's vision impairment, but then beyond that, every phone's different depending on the setup. 
So the other thing that your phones can have for you are magnifying apps. So to help you with reading, so you can make things bigger. You also can change the color of filter. And so this is one example of the magnifying app. I do have QR codes. My student helped me be hip here today. Um, <laughs> and these are instructions for how to use those apps. So on the left is the magnifier app for the iPhone. It's literally called magnifier. It's built into your phone. Uh, for Android, um, we used to have one called Visor. They're not um, as much working with Androids anymore. So I'm encouraging people to use WeZoom. Um, so again, these are these two options for you. When you use the QR code, it will um, take you to the link to learn how to download the app and more information about that app. So the last, one of the last things we'll talk about is reading. So reading is a big deal for our patients, whether it's reading a recipe, the mail, the bills, this is um, my grandmother's recipe card that she's had forever. And as you can see, it fades over time and it's very hard to read. So basically we can use visual assistive devices, whether it's a hand magnifier to make things bigger and brighter for you because it has that light with it. Um, or you can use closed circuit TVs, um, which come in portable versions or um, a desktop version. Um, and so basically it can change that color background and increase that magnification to help you read what you need to read. Writing activities with writing, um, 2020 pens um, give you more contrast compared to a regular pen or pencil. Um, on the middle screen, uh, middle uh, picture here, I have a grocery list. Banana and pears are written in pen. Apple and grapes are written in the 2020 pen. A little bit bolder, easier to see. Um, we also have bold line paper, again, helps you kind of stay on the line a little bit easier compared to college rule paper, where it's had those very faint lines, hard to see. And then also you have large print checks. Um, these are called cited, what are they now called? They change them all the time. Guideline checks, there it is. Guideline checks, most, most um, banks have them. And the example is in the middle. It has those nice bold lines. They're actually raised slightly. And then, um, makes it easier for writing compared to the standard check. And then also the, there are large print puzzles, whether it's large print Sudoku, um, crosswords. Um, there's, I, can, I can't think of the name right now, but I bought it off Amazon. They have a pretty good um, puzzle book that's helpful. And then going to the technology, this is all very similar and I'm noticing my time. So I am gonna go through this a little quickly. Um, because the theme is basically the same. We, every device you have, you always look how I can make it better for yourself. And if you see something that has a big A, little A, that should be your hint that, hey, I may be able to change the font. So this is the Kindle Fire app, which is also the same thing as like the basic Kindle Fire itself, but you can use the apps so you can put on any of your devices. If you tap the center of the um, screen, a big A, little A comes on the top right-hand corner. There you can change the font, the color, the spacing, all of that. Amazon Ember Bold is my favorite font um, because it is a little thicker and it's a little bit bolder. So that is available. They also have a reading ruler, which is nice because if you need to kind of keep your pace as you're going with reading, it helps you stay on the line. So on the top right here, it's kind of sam the words are sandwiched between the line and the bottom right on the bottom, it's underneath. So it's kind of like you're blocking all the extra information and doing one line at a time, which can be helpful for reading. On the computer, um, the I, the this is for the Mac and also, uh, I'm sorry, the Mac computer and the iPhone iPad. If you're in Safari, Safari has reader view. And when you are look at the top left of the URL, again, there's that big A, little a. When you tap on it, it will give you availability to make the font bigger or smaller with the little a, big A. But then if you hit show reader, this show reader will get rid of all the junk, as I call it. And that means the extra advertisements, the pictures that aren't associated with the article, it gives you a nice clean read. So it makes it amazing to know to be able to read. You can do that same thing on the computer with Google Chrome. Um, they uh, is an extension that you need to add. And if you, I will give you my information at the end if you can't find how to um, 
find this information, I'm happy to send you the info, the link, or I can actually give it to Katie too. And we can add it if we can to the um, handout. And then Microsoft Edge also has the immersion reader as well. And this immersion reader actually is new with Edge. It's probably, I've noticed it around November of last year, and it's actually built into the system. So it's nothing you don't need to add. It's right there on the top right-hand side of the URL bar. And you'll see this little book that has like a little um, microphone with it. And it will, again, get rid of all the junk and make it really nice for reading. And the last thing, I believe this is my last thing, uh, is TV. TV is tricky. Um, sometimes my patients wear filters, um, definitely turn the lights out. It makes it easier to see the screen. Um, as we talked about TV viewing, you can get a bigger screen. You can sit closer. Um, there are some telescopes that you can wear as well, but that helps with the magnification component with contrast. I sometimes tell people to change the contrast settings in their TV. So that's like a different remote usually. Um, again, we talked about wearing filters, sometimes wearing a yellow or a plum, even orange, depending on the person that can help with the contrast. Um, but the biggest thing um, that has been changed lately with all this streaming um, and with Xfinity and Verizon is you can change the text size and color of the clothes caption. So on the right here, that bottom, you can make the text size bigger. And then you also, it can be black background with white letters or white with black letters. You have to look at each device and under um, like in Netflix, for example, if you go to the language, you'll see where you can change the language if needed, but then also that's where the closed captioning is as well. And it's different per each show. Um, sometimes with Netflix, you can go into your account on the computer and make those changes and it will stay there always. Um, the other thing I also just love about TV viewing is audio description. So if anyone, um, if you want more information about the, uh, show that you're viewing, um, this will talk to fill in that information when people aren't talking. So audio description is also another good, um, system here. So. Again, the wrap up, if you haven't got the theme by now, <laughs> contrast is super important. It is an important measure that we really need to look at throughout um, our day and then th in order and throughout our process with adjusting division loss um, because it does impact function. Very important to have a low vision optometry evaluation to make sure not only you have a really good refraction, you're wearing the correct glasses, depending on what activity you're doing, but also to monitor your contrast sensitivity and help you make those changes that we talked about today in the presentation to your life. And then also kind of, again, increase referrals to other people in the community, whether it's an occupational therapist, um, a certified low vision therapist, or a certified vision rehabilitation therapist, um, for students um, that work with people with vision, uh, students that have vision impairment, their teachers with visually impaired can help them. A state agency, every state has an agency that can help um, people get devices and services. So we have to uh, um, see how you apply for them. And so contacting your state to see who can help you in that regards will be another option. And then also if you're a veteran, um, our veterans of the VA services are amazing. You got to get into the system to see if you qualify for services and they can help um, you get the equipment and things that you need. And also if there's any OTs, occupational therapists or speech therapist or physical therapist listening, um, we all need to measure contrast. It literally takes probably a minute or two to do this test. And it's a very important measure that we as healthcare practitioners can incorporate into our evaluation to help teach and make modifications to our environment to help our patients. So here is my contact information, my email, and then also my phone number. Um, that phone number, just letting you know, it goes, um, it's a Microsoft Teams number. Um, so it will go to directly to my computer, wherever I'm at. Um, um, but nine times out of 10, I probably won't be able to answer because I'm on the phone or working with a patient. But if you leave a message, I definitely will give you a call back. And thank you guys. Let me know if you have any questions. There are some questions in the chat. We're not going to, I don't think we'll be able to get to them today during the live presentation, um, but we will do, we will um, get those um, to you, Kristen, to oh, yeah, um, absolutely. via email. Um, and maybe we can address them in the handouts that we will post after the 
the Absolutely. webinar. Um, so yes, and um, Kristen, um, you, if you also want to, um, up to you if you want to put your um, email in the um, chat as well. Oh, absolutely. So um, thank you so much.